our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. My goal in this deposition was to be truthful, but not particularly helpful. And then we just added, because I think it needs to be done, uh, no tax permanently on gas stoves. They want your gas stove. Welcome to Unspun, the podcast that makes you better at finding the truth. The way people get news is changing. There used to be lots of reporters who would research stories and write articles, but now many politicians and famous people share information directly through social media and the internet. This means people can learn news fast, but it also means they have to be very careful that the news is true. One way misinformation spreads is through unchecked sharing. Remember, it's not just about the facts, it's also about critically thinking about the logic and coherence of information before you hit that share button. Newsmakers aren't helping. The temptation to manipulate is strong. Newsmakers might bend the truth to deceive, avoid accountability, advance their own agendas, and recognizing these motivations is key to finding the truth. We're at a crossroads where anyone can share anything online. This makes it even more important to sharpen your critical thinking skills. Identifying those fake narratives before they go viral is pretty much an essential survival skill. And we'll do it together. Let's get unspun. There's a young woman, uh, a young racist in Atlanta. She's a racist. And they say, I guess they say that she was after a certain gang and she ended up having an affair with the head of the gang or a gang member. And this is a person that wants to indict me. She's got a lot of problems. That was Trump this fall, talking about the Fulton County prosecutor who was charging him with essentially running a crime organization to put in fake electors and mess up the vote count in Georgia in 2020. You're not supposed to talk about people like that. Why is that? Well, it's bad practice for a fair trial. The idea is that if the president says bad things about the person who's prosecuting him before a trial can even be set, then people might not think as well of the prosecutor, or they might have a difficult time being neutral. It's another problem, too, a logical process called poisoning the well. It's illegal in the case of tampering with witnesses and potential jurors in a court proceeding, but it is also a bad idea overall. Even if you're not in court, if you give people a bad opinion on an issue ahead of time, they may not be able to overcome that and be fair when the person speaks or the idea is brought up. That doesn't stop the U.S. Congress from having these kinds of speeches as a part of their regular work. Here's how it works. The people who want to make speeches, members of Congress, will sit in the front seats on the side for their party, with Republicans with the Republicans and Democrats with Democrats. And the speaker recognizes the members, starting with the majority party and then going back and forth. Majority, minority, majority, minority. If there is a theme for the week, which is sometimes picked by the leadership, those who want to address the theme will go first. The speaking member will stand up and the chair will recognize them. And then the member will say, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute to revise and extend my remarks. And that gets ordered, and then they have one minute to give their talk. And in fact, they don't even have to give the speech. They can ask that their speech just be entered straight into the congressional record. Let's listen to a few examples. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, many years ago, I received an undergraduate degree in journalism, was a reporter on a daily newspaper, and taught journalism for one year. In those years, there was a clear separation between the front page and the editorial page. I don't believe I've ever read a more biased, partisan, opinionated paragraph than in a, quote, news story than one that was on the front page of yesterday's Washington Post. Philip Rucker does now not now deserve the title of journalist, but instead should be referred to as a Democratic or left-wing hack. He wrote that a traditional president would have reacted, quote, carefully to the London attacks by instilling calm, being judicious, and appealing to the country's better angels. Instead, he accused President Trump of reacting impulsively, stroking panic and fear, being indiscreet with details, and capitalizing on it to advocate for one of his more polarizing policies and to advance a personal feud. Apparently, Mr. Rucker is so blinded by hatred for the president, he cannot see straight and has written one of the most unfair one-sided articles I have ever read in a, quote, news story in what used to be 
a newspaper. You can hear in that example that one-minute speech that Representative John Duncan from Tennessee is trying to set up an opinion about journalist Phil Rucker from The Washington Post. He's speaking about things he wrote about the presidential response to a London terrorist attack. Let's listen to one more. While massive terrorist acts are raging all around the world, while in my district yesterday, three people were shot and killed, one a 28-year-old father of three, and just last week, a mother shot dead her two daughters and was killed because she refused to put down the gun. We have a moment in history in the backdrop of the largest mass murder by guns by a bad person in Orlando, Florida, as we mourn, to be able to do something significant, Mr. Speaker, and that is to pass the Thompson King bipartisan gun common sense responsible legislation. Let me tell you what's being offered on the floor. That bill that's being offered on the floor would not have prevented the Emanuel 9 because it allows individuals uh, to go past, uh, if you will, the checking, because in the part of it that deals with terrorists in particular, uh, you can ask or the prosecutors must prove uh, that you belong on that terrorist list. And therefore, you put a barrier to protecting the American people. We need a no-fly, no-buy on the terrorist list. You can't do it. And we need a longer period time enforcement to check the background checks. We need to save lives. I yield back. What is the poison in the well there? What does the speaker want you to think or think about? She talks first about different examples of gun violence. And she then calls for her colleagues to support gun legislation. But she uses words like common sense and responsible and bipartisan. The Congress will vote on the bill later, but for now, she's trying to attach positive words and positive vibes to the bill before they take it up. Of course, politicians in Congress make the news, but they aren't the only ones who talk about the news. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee has signed a new law banning public drag performances with a six-year prison sentence for repeat offenders, as first predicted in the now documentary, Medea Goes to Jail. <laughs> That's a clip from Weekend Update, a fixture of Saturday Night Live since the beginning. Sometimes it's the actors who play anchors who are giving elements of the news. Sometimes it's more dramatic characters like Opera Man or, you know, a recent segment where Jafar talks about DeSantis and Disney. These early efforts from Saturday Night Live eventually blossomed into multitudinous late-night talk show hosts like the Jimmys, Kimmel and Fallon, and Stephen Colbert doing either extended monologues about the news or in some cases entire shows like The Daily Show on Comedy Central. Most people are familiar with the idea of parody news, and researchers have been interested in it as well. A big question people answer is whether getting your news in that comedy package kind of helps you to understand more about your world. Does a spoonful of sugar really help the medicine to go down? Well, today we're talking about the art of using comedy to tackle serious or controversial topics. A lot of comedians today use humor to take on tough issues, but it can be a risky move. Late-night comedy shows are all known for their political humor. Comedian John Oliver has tackled subjects from government surveillance to farm workers to solitary confinement on his show Last Week Tonight on HBO. Samantha Bee covered things from gun control to abortion on her show Full Frontal with Samantha Bee. And Saturday Night Live actors have been portraying politicians for the entire history of the show. From racism to the future of artificial intelligence, comedians cover tough topics. The comedy makes these dense topics more accessible, and it provides a different way to confront difficult realities. It's an indirect way to point out systemic problems that might otherwise be too painful to address head-on. But there are benefits and also risks to this comedy approach. While comedy can creatively highlight injustice or hypocrisy, there's a chance of crossing from funny to offensive if you don't handle it carefully. Jokes about oppression and trauma can easily backfire, especially from the comedians seen as outsiders to the affected group. Men talking about women's issues, for example. It's all in the eyes of the audience. Audiences may be offended by edgy material that pushes boundaries too far. And this pushing can have real consequences for the comedian. According to a 2022 article in The Guardian, British comedian Joe Lysette has said he was investigated by the police after an audience member made a complaint about a joke in one of his shows. In a post on Instagram, he revealed that he was asked to explain the context of the gag and that the authorities have now closed the case. Lysette, who was 33, said he hoped that the joke amused the arresting officers and that it would stay in his stand-up routine for the rest of his UK and Ireland tour. 
He shared a photo of the police's message confirming the matter was closed and wrote, So someone came to my tour show a few weeks back and was offended by one of the jokes. And their perfectly understandable response was this, to call the forking police. He didn't say forking. To be fair, to them the fuzz were very nice about it and all, but they felt like they had that duty to investigate. And that was a pretty mild consequence. An article in CNN from this year talks about a Chinese stand-up comedian who made a joke, quote, a Chinese stand-up comedian who made a joke with, quote, a loose reference to the country's military, prompted anger from authorities and an official investigation into the company that represents him. According to the article, the controversy underscores the delicate line comedians must tread in highly censored China, a country where politics is rarely a laughing matter. Li Haoshi caught the attention of authorities after using a phrase associated with the People's Liberation Army as he told a story about two stray dogs in his recent comedy routine, according to state-affiliated Jimu News. He later expressed his, quote, deep remorse in a social media post on Monday, saying that he had used an, quote, extremely unsuitable analogy to bring bad feeling and association to the audience, the article says. The controversy stemmed from his show at the Century Theater in Beijing, where he joked about how he had adopted two stray dogs since he moved to Shanghai. He went on to say that one day his two energetic canines gave chase to a squirrel, which reminded him of eight words, before he delivered the controversial punchline, according to audio posted to Chinese social media site Weibo. Fine style of work, capable of winning battles, he said, flipping a well-known Chinese Communist Party slogan referring to the People's Liberation Army. And of course, we have a lot of examples in the U.S. as well. So is using comedy for real-world events worthwhile? Well, research from Georgia Southern University suggests that if audiences already agree with the message, straightforward hard news reporting informs well. But comedy can be more successful in reaching those who disagree with a viewpoint, opening them to hear new perspective. The humor acts as a Trojan horse to bypass people's biases. Other researchers found that political comedy increases your likelihood to actually do things like vote. And humor can diffuse tense disagreements. For example, one New York Times article describes how a derisive joke can diffuse tense and outrageous situations. In 2007, for example, protesters dressed as clowns confronted a white power march in Charlotte, North Carolina, holding signs that read wife power and throwing white flour into the air. It made the white nationalists look ridiculous and avoided a violent confrontation, which would have served the interests of the racists. A number of studies have examined the impact of comedic late-night shows like Saturday Night Live and The Daily Show that use satire or humor that mocks issues or people, you know, often in politics or news. And these popular programs blend entertainment and humor with news content in various degrees. So, for example... Uh, Saturday Night Live's Weekend Update segment, researchers found that it focuses more on developing fun comedy personalities like Opera Man than it does on actual hard-hitting political satire. The hosts stand out more than the news stories that they mock. In looking at The Daily Show, several studies analyze how much young viewers actually learn from the comedic format versus just being entertained. And really, the findings are mixed. Some evidence shows that Listeners, viewers become more increasingly negative toward politicians when they're featured on the show and show that also they develop lower trust in government in general. But other stories don't find those strong effects on political attitude. The type of humor that they use seems to make a difference. More complex satire using irony, you know, saying the opposite of what is meant, doesn't seem to change opinions much, but may lead people to think less critically about what's being said. For example, saying a politician gave a brilliant speech when the satirist actually thought it was terrible. Simple sarcasm or mocking someone through caustic remarks like, that was the dumbest speech I've ever heard, doesn't limit the thinking about the message as much. And then, the reasons why people watch these shows can vary. Some watch just for laughs, but others may want to actually gain political knowledge or see critical perspectives on the news. Overall, Research suggests that these shows prioritize humor, personalities, and entertainment over serious political content. They're walking a line between fun comedy and satire with the message. So learning from them relies in part on whether the audience is seeking political information or just a laugh. When we come back, I'm going to interview an internet comedian, and I know you want to stay tuned for that. Okay, welcome back. You might know him as Brittle Star, as the internet's favorite dad with a quirky spelling on favorite, as the creator of Sex and Gold Vodka, or just a grown man who pretends for a living. But he's also the forthcoming author of the very funny Welcome to the Stupid Apocalypse. Um, 
I know him as this week's guest. So welcome to Unspun, Stuart Reynolds. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate that. And then listen, favorite spelt correctly. It's exactly how it should be spelt. I didn't say wrong. I just said quirky. (laughs) Everyone can agree on quirky, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So um, I did my due diligence on your background. And so I noticed that you were a philosophy major. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say that some of the smartest people I know study philosophy because I think thinking about, you know, how we know stuff eventually makes your thinking very clear. So how do you get from that to jingle writing? <laughs> I mean, this pro- I mean, it reminds me of a uh, an old Second City sketch, a SCTV sketch with Harold Ramis, who uh, it was like a fake commercial where he turned around and there's a newspaper and he put it down. He said, how many times have you seen this? Philosopher wanted, high pay. Philosopher needed, will pay, and benefits. And I think that's that's how you get from philosophy to jingles is probably food and necessity, sustenance, uh, requirements of living, cash, that type of thing. But I mean, I've always been involved in music. I come from a pretty musical family and uh, philosophy has always fascinated me as well. Like it's just been, uh, I like the idea of always asking why, why, why? And, you know, the further you go with that, you can go really, really deep and then you find out at some point people are like, I don't know. I have no idea why, (laughs) which is kind of reassuring in a weird way. And then to get from there to jingles, it's like, I, like I said, I was involved in music and, uh, jingles were a way for me to tell my mom and dad that I was actually making money doing it. Okay. So it all comes back to the money. Um, Exactly. There's a transition in there then, right. To making some viral content for brands. But it seems like uh, at some point you kind of took a turn a little bit and got kind of more into social issues. So I'm interested in knowing what what kind of inspired you to produce these kinds of pro-civic videos that you do. Um, I think one of the weird points of transition was, I mean, obviously the big the big shift for me and for a lot of people was 2016 in U.S. politics. Things kind of went a bit weird and it kind of went from a ha 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 to like, oh, no, Um And I think that that kind of shifted my perspective on what was happening in the world and maybe how I could maybe use my platform to maybe make things better and maybe help clarify things. I think the thing, you know, a couple of things. One is that in 2016, things went from politics to just more almost ethical issues and just rights and wrongs and and really basic, uh, you know, nothing's black and white, but I mean, it went to me like, well, this isn't just policy decision. This isn't just what we think might be kind of better. This is now just a plain old ethical question or moral question. And I felt it was important to kind of address that and to, to especially being sort of a white, straight, you know, middle-aged dude, I thought maybe I should, maybe I could be the middle-aged white guy whisperer and I can, you know, speak to other people who are like me and go, this is, this is weird, right? You guys are seeing this um, and this is not right as well. Some of the stuff that was happening. and. I think, you know, it's, I looked at sort of what was happening. There's so much information happening. There's so much information being shot at people. Uh, Social media was becoming so incredibly uh, ingrained in in our daily lives, but that just meant more access to more information. It made it really hard to process. And I'm a big believer that if you want people to process information and messaging, you entertain first and you sell second. And I think that it's, that's why I thought, well, maybe I can, you know, in my limited understanding and my tiny brain, maybe I can kind of like chew up some of these issues and spit them out like a mama bird, except less gross than that. So, yeah. That's really interesting to me. I have some family in Canada and I remember at one point uh, the big joke they were making was that although, you know, there was a lot of bluster in this country about building a wall on the Mexican border, the Canadians would just be kind of quietly planting a privacy hedge. To... <laughs> That's pretty, pretty accurate. That's a, there's sort of a, a general feeling. I mean, the thing, the thing is that I, I love America. There's so I have numerous American friends, which sounds like a really weird thing to say and suspect. Uh, but I really do. And we love going to other States and it's already fun, but I always kind of, kind of chuckle to myself whenever I, the customs, you know, border guards look at me like I'm going to stay. It's like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not staying. I'm just, I'm going to come give you lots of money. Then I'm going to go home after that. Okay. <laughs> so from what we do see down here in the States, Canada looks pretty chill compared to what goes on in our country, you know, in the political sense. 
you know, so perhaps, you know, you might have a dumpster, but it's not actually on fire or something like that. <laughs> Is that accurate or are we missing something? No, I mean, you know, stupid doesn't need a passport. Stupid goes wherever it's want, wherever it wants and doesn't have a nationality. So, I mean, there's, I mean, there's weirdness and stupidity and idiocy everywhere. And certainly in Canada, there is for sure. I think that, you know, Canada being a 10th the size of the U S it's literally our issues seem 10% less. Or they seem like 10% of what your issues are in the States rather. Um, so I think that, you know, we do have those issues. They're just not quite as wacky. And also, I mean, it, to be really, really blunt, uh, like, you know, thankfully, it's, we just, we don't have the same gun culture. So if I might go, like, there's a huge rally and convoy that happened in Ottawa uh, that was there. They were, like, essentially occupying huge blocks of downtown Ottawa last a week, a year ago, February. And it was turned into a big thing because they were there for, like, a couple of months. And, but at no point in time, I think, was anyone thinking, well, they're armed. I think everyone just thought there's just a bunch of jerks and you're probably going to get punched if you go down there, but that's about it. So I think that's, I think that, you know, bluntly plays a huge part in Canada's still kind of, I don't know, still has that sort of, you're maybe going to get hit. <laughs> the worst things have happened. I mean, Hannah, Canada has its violence as well, but yeah, it's just a little less, a little softened compared to the States. Okay. So what do you think is important for people outside of Canada to know about Canada? Um... I think it depends on who's uh, who we're referring to outside of Canada. If I was, <clears throat> I think one of the things I try to express to, you know, friends from America is that the difference in Canada is that it's a little less melting pot and it's cliche, but it's, I call it a cultural mosaic, which is the kind of a really nice romantic way to put it. But it basically means that everyone comes here and there are a few things that tie us together, but there's no all Canadian boy, all Canadian girl. There's no shared Canadian dream. There's none of that stuff. It's just like, just don't be a jerk. Just come here, don't be a jerk and get your coffee, go for dinner, go shopping and you know, get your coffee at Tim Hortons, go shopping at Canadian Tire and do your thing. And that's the, that, those weird sort of commercial things kind of bind us uh, because there's really not a lot else. I mean, I, but we're all still Canadian, I think, and in, in, in a stat, you know, I mean, there's, there's some small characteristics, but there's not, not, not the same sort of like American uh, melting pot idea. It's not the same thing. I'm curious, when you uh, do your uh, baby bird preparation of information for other people, um, first of all, what kind of response you get? And second of all, if it's different from the Americans in your audience and the Canadians? Well, you know, what's interesting is that like back in 2016, I, I've never been interested in politics. I've always hated politics, found it super boring. I find it a particularly sleazy industry, for lack of a better term. Um, but in 2016, I I made a couple of sort of like lighthearted videos kind of poking fun at uh, at Donald Trump. And I got lots of anger, like, stay out of our business. <laughs> and it's like, okay. Um, and I kind of left it alone until it became unavoidable. And I had to, you know, I felt there was a need to sort of say things about, you know, human rights and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, I, and I could see it happening in Canada as well. So it felt like I had to do something. Um, the reaction, though, now in the past few years, is like it's, it's overwhelmingly positive, and it's, which is really lovely and really weird as well. I don't know why uh, people would feel that the way I can digest stuff out and spit it back out is somehow useful to them, but it's great. I mean, I think that's the, that's, that's kind of the gold standard, I think of, or the dream as far as being someone who works in creative industries. If you can make something that is, that has utility as well as, you know, entertainment in its broadest sense, um, then that's kind of it. I mean, you, you've kind of, it doesn't get much better than that. And that's kind of where I've been lucky enough to sort of find myself for the most part is I'll do lots of silly stuff, but sometimes I'll do stuff that has a little bit of an underlying message or some or has some pretty direct messaging um, with a bit of a, a smile to it or not, a nod and a wink. Um, and people seem to be able to use that as self-expression, which is the key as well on social media, is that people can use your content to express how they feel, then that's a good thing. Okay. So that being said, you do use humor a lot in your work. Um, mm. How do you think that plays with getting your messages across? 
I think that's the sugar for the pill. I think that's I think that's it. it. I think that you know, one of the things the comedy is incredibly powerful. Uh, it's and what's interesting about for, for me with comedy is that I was never involved in comedy prior to doing this crazy social media career, which I've been doing full time for the past ten plus years. Um, I had to kind of like learn what comedy meant and call it why I think you know, occasionally I'll do something funny. But that doesn't mean I'm I can make something funny that's going to appeal to a lot of people. There's a big difference. So there's a lot of there's a lot of art to it and a lot of skill to it and learned skill to it. And I'm not remotely as good as I as other people are at it yet. Um, maybe someday I will be. But uh, it's tough and it's hard. But it's so powerful because you can you can take a very serious message and you can kind of wrap it in itself and it looks ridiculous. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it goes back to things like the emperor's new clothes and stories like that, where it's like, this is a, this, there's a big message here, but it's being wrapped in this ridiculous notion of having, you know, the, the, the king, the emperor rather with, with going down the street naked. Um, and there's, it's like, that's funny. Ha ha ha. Oh, wait a minute. That's got a bit of a message. And that's kind of the, you, you try to hit that. And if you can do that, then you can get messaging across really well, which really helped when I was doing, you know, more public health messaging style content during the pandemic. That was kind of my focus was how can I, how can I take this very serious life or death message and wrap it in a manner that's not going to freak people out, not going to bore them. That was always the goal. So how do you pick the topics that you uh, cover? Um, I, th- I mean, they have to be important to me initially. I think that they have to, uh, they have to be topics that I feel I can learn enough about that I'm not going to be a complete idiot when I comment on them. Um, I try to, you know, uh, I try to sort of get as much confirmation of how I feel about something before I go ahead and spout it off. Because uh, there's a lot of things I'll read or, or you'll come across in the news and, I'll, you know, you'll think to yourself, well, come on now, that can't be, this, surely that's not the case. And if you you check it out, you go, well, no, it isn't the case. This is just being blown out of proportion. And you can go to trusted sources and and by trusted sources, you know, being like people who are a, a million times smarter than I am. And if you if they can confirm, okay, no, you're right, that you're, you know, this is ridiculous, then I feel comfortable choosing that topic and going forward with something that uh I can make fun of and kind of almost like vindicate my own come on now. <laughs> that sense. <laughs> Are there topics that you think are important, but you wouldn't want to touch? Um, I mean, there's lots of topics that I feel like it's, it's not really, it's not really my, my voice isn't necessarily going to help the conversation that much. I mean, I think in Canada, uh, there's lots of, you know, with the Truth and Reconciliation Act, which is uh, for Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, I, I try to kind of be, like it's not going to help if I do a, if I do a funny video about you know you know indigenous suffering throughout the years. That's not, I don't know. That's not helping. It doesn't matter how funny it is. It's not going to help anybody. Uh, and it would be super hard to make funny. And so I feel like stuff like that. I sort of feel like I, I like I said, it's, if my voice isn't going to add anything to it, if it's better if I just shut up and I maybe amplify people, and that's probably what I'll do. Uh, but other stuff. I mean, like I said earlier. I sort of do feel like the middle-aged white guy whisperer in the sense that I feel there's issues that are, you know, like they could be, you know, 2S, LGBTQ plus uh, issues that would normally maybe cause consternation for other middle-aged white folk. And it's like, I, I want to be able to tell them, no one's coming for your beer, no one's coming for your back deck or your cargo shorts. You can relax. It's okay. It just means everyone gets to have stuff they like. That's it. So that's all. Okay. And um, what kind of impact do you hope that you're having with your work? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's so funny because when I started doing the videos, uh, I really felt like they were just silly. They're mainly for me. That's the, the reason I started making the videos was was literally to cheer myself up because I'd been so down. We were going through a terrible fiscal time. Our business had collapsed and and it was really, really dire. And I thought I have to do something to make myself smile because I watched these this YouTube video of outtakes from the office. And I was like, man, it'd be great to have a job like that. Wouldn't it just be like be able to laugh every day? And uh, I thought, well, this is dumb. I should just do something to try to make myself happy. So they literally started off as being just for me. 
And then in 2013, in fall of that year, I went to a Vine meetup and I, we'd had some success on Vine. And this woman came up and she was in her late 50s and she gave me this big hug. And I was like, who the hell is this crazy lady? And she said, I just want to thank you for uh, making your videos. It got me and my family through a really hard time recently. And I was like, what? Like it was, it always sounds like I'm kind of blowing my own horn then when I say that, but I, and I am. Uh, but at the same time, it's also, it was so ridiculous to me that I'd made these stupid videos on my phone and they somehow had purpose and utility and were acting as a life preserver for people. And it's not to overstate the value of the, the, the goofy content that I create. Um, but it's to say that that is, you know, that's always so motivating. And so, uh, that's sort of what keeps me going is, is that idea of, being able to create something that has utility and has purpose. And it's also, it's serving multiple needs. It's making me happy. It scratches that creative itch. It lets me do stuff and make things out of nothing. It lets me laugh. It lets me have fun. And if somebody else, if it brings them out of a bad day or if it makes them forget their troubles for, you know, 40 seconds, that's amazing. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm not a religious person, but I'll say I'm blessed to be able to do that for sure. Awesome. If we could switch topics a minute, I'd love to talk about your book. Uh, so yeah. welcome to the stupid apocalypse, and it's a it's a funny but also kind of serious set of essays. I think on a whole variety of topics, <laughs> and I'd like to read a quote from it. Uh, so oh, this basic responsibility that comes with living in a democratic society has been decaying. People have lost faith in the system and the idea that their vote counts. Of course, this is exactly what the ne'er do wells want. They love this kind of thing, and by this kind of thing, I mean stupid people. It makes winning elections easy, simply offer the most entertaining or fun election promises, and that should do the trick, because what does it matter? Is that why you wrote the book, or what were your goals? Yeah, I mean, my my goal with the book was, similar to kind of the content that I create on social media, the goal was to say to people, we have to point out the stupidity around us without forgetting that we're stupid as well. Uh, so it's not pointing at any one particular group and saying those people by the fact that they're in that group are stupid. It's saying, look at that stupid thing that person's doing. That's stupid, right? We all agree that's stupid. Okay, great. And here's why it's stupid. And then knowing that at any point in time, someone else could point the finger at us and say, what you're doing is stupid as well. Because I think that's part of the human condition is that, you know, you're, we're idiots. We're complete idiots. And uh, we you know, we rely on ourselves to, to have our best guesses and to have the ability to, you know, make educated guesses about what we're doing. But there's still a guarantee, a guaranteed every single person on the planet that ever has been on the planet is an idiot at some point, has done something stupid. Um, and that's okay. That's part of being human. That's all right. And the key is to realize when you realize you're not that smart, if you realize you're a little bit stupid, then you're already ahead of the game. And that's kind of the goal is to say, like, we're all we're all stupid. So let's not let's not cast judgment on other people right away. But let's also not be afraid to say, hold up a mirror to things and say, this looks dumb, right? This this is silly. And I think that's that's how you grow. I think that's how you, that's how you get better. And it, it's hopefully being done in an entertaining way in the book. I hope. Okay. That's great. And so for uh, American listeners, how would they get a copy? You can go to your local bookstore, you can go to Amazon.com, you can go to Barnes & Noble, wherever you buy books, you can go in and get it there. It's Simon & Schuster is the, label, is the publisher that owns the label that I'm on, which is Postal Press. Um, so you can get the book anywhere, and you can also find it linked online at stupidpocalypse.com. It's spelt like you'd think okay. it would be. I can put a link in the show notes, too, so that'll be great. All right, now for really the most important questions. I have a couple of butter tart questions uh -oh. for you. Okay, I'm ready. Right. I'm ready. I'm ready. I have to explain what a butter tart is. Um, and then you can correct me because you probably have a better idea than I do. Yeah. But I think of it as kind of mm. like if you had a pecan pie, but you took the pecans out mm. and then mm. you kind of like married it to a treacle tart and they had a baby. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'll give you that. I'll get, I can see the, I can see the parallels to pecan pie for sure. I think especially for, for the, you know, the folks down south, I think you, you think of a pecan pie, a nice thick pecan pie, um, almost like a Chicago slush pie type of thing, um, but no pecans ideally. You can, you, can, you can get pecans and butter tarts, but I don't approve of it. 
I don't condone it. But listen, I'm not here to judge people. I'm here to, if, if that makes you happy and it doesn't hurt anyone else, that's fine by me. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I described butter tarts as if you put sex and gold into a blender, you get a butter tart. And that's kind of, it's just, it's like a, it's a, it's, it's just basically sugar and butter <laughs> melted in a small pie format. Two favorite food groups. <laughs> um, so runny or firm? That's the big question. Well, what you want is a little combination of both. What you want is a little bit of a, you want to be able to cut it or bite it. And you don't want it running all over your hand. I mean, that seems, I mean, some people are freaks and they like that kind of thing. Again, if they're not hurting anyone, that's fine. But it's it's disturbing to me. So they long little bit around me. Um, but you want to be able to bite it and just see a little bit of droop. A little bit of droop. I was lucky enough to be a judge at a butter tart contest uh, in Midland, Ontario this past summer. And... 72,000 people show up for this thing every year. And the town is only 7,000 people. It is mayhem. And uh, I remember they were like, just take a quarter of a, car of a tart when you're tasting. Just take a little tiny, an eighth of a tart. And I was like, I gotta eat like a big bite. By the fourth tart, I was ready to die. So I decided to go down to an eighth. But then I realized what I liked best about cutting them. So you'd cut them, it'd be thick and firm, but you'd have just a little bit of a droop. And that's the key. That's what you want. Okay. And so you've already said no nuts, but how about raisins? Raisins or no? I, I don't mind raisins. I think uh, I grew up um, across our house was beside a convenience store, like a corner store, across the street from a corner store, across the street from another corner store, and across the street from a supermarket. And sometimes the only butter tarts you get in any of those places were the raisin butter tarts. So I've, I've you know, I think we all pay our dues in different ways and we all suffer in our own way. And I feel that the, uh, you know, butter tarts with raisins slash sultanas, that's just what you, I mean, you have to, you do what you'd have to do. You do what you have to do. Fair enough. And is butter tart one word or two? It's actually two words. Um, though I, I feel it should be one. I'm pretty strong, strong feelings about it becoming one word because it is kind of its own thing. It's not a butter tart. It's a butter tart is what it is. Fair yeah. enough. Should be one. Okay. From my uh, old journalism days, uh, last thing I always ask is, what is something I should have asked you, but I didn't? Um, I think you probably should have asked me, like, how do I get my hair looking so good? And I'm a little offended that you didn't ask, actually. But I'll tell you, it's a, a simple step of uh, some Tresemme uh, smoothing cream and uh, then some Frizzy's Ultra Mist Intense Hold Hairspray. <laughs> His hold seems really important in that sentence. I'm a grown man. <laughs> Doing a lot of work, yeah. That is awesome. Well, all right. So, Stuart Reynolds, thank you so much. Everybody check out your book, Welcome to the Stupid Apocalypse. It's coming out the end of this month. Thanks for getting Unspun with me this week. Unspun is a production of me, Amanda Sturgill, and is a proud member of the MSW Media family of podcasts. Send me your ideas for trickery in the news on Gmail at theunspunpodcast at gmail.com. I write back. And find the show notes and more information at theunspunpodcast.substack.com. Want to learn more and get smarter? Check out my book, Detecting Deception, Tools to Fight Fake News, available at Amazon or your favorite online bookseller. And until next week, stay sharp, everyone. <laughs>